stock see some gains ahead of the RBI's monetary policy meeting decision on Thursday. Consumer durables as well as the industrials lead the gains while PSU banks and autos drag today. Banks and NBFCs including top names like HDFC Bank, HDFC Bajaj Finance and Indusin Bank report strong growth in advances and deposits for the fourth quarter Boeing sentiment. Windfall tax on domestic crude oil output is cut to nil and halved on diesel exports, offering some relief to the producers. But the recent rise in global crude prices raises the risk of tax reversion. CNBC TV 18 learns that a cabinet meeting is likely later this week or next week at which the recommendations of the Kirat Parikh Committee on Gas Sector Reforms are likely to be taken up. And most experts polled by CNBC TV18 expect the Reserve Bank to hike the repo rate by 25 basis points. But all eyes are on the stance. Market fears RBI may not clearly say it's the <coughs> last hike given the global uncertainties. Hello and welcome. You've tuned into Business Lunch. I'm Nisha Podar and with me as always is my co-anchor Pavitra Parekh. So Pavitra, good day of trade today actually. Green on the screen, yeah. especially ahead of the RBI policy announcement that's coming up tomorrow. But I think the market is now convinced that uh, even if there's no pause, there is definitely a tempering down across the world in central bank stance on this interest rate hike, given uh, the other aspects that are really cropping up. So it has to be seen as far as the stance is concerned for the RBI. But today, uh, Nifty 50 at lunch hour is at the high point of the trading session, 0.77% up in trade, gaining about 132 points, 17,500 uh, level is crossed and comfortably achieved by Nifty 50 at this point. Almost 500 points gained by Sensex and Bank Nifty is also um, showing good amount of gains today, 0.4% up, though there is slight underperformance to the key indices. As far as mid caps are concerned, it's flat at the moment and that's also impacting to some extent the advanced decline ratio, which is heavily in favor of the advances, Pavitra. You know, even for the mid-caps, for the better part of the morning, we did see significant significant cuts come through, but that's also sort of really cut its losses. It's looking flat, just around 15 points in the red, so looking quite encouraging there for the mid-cap index. But today, in terms of stock-specific action, it's a lot about the financials, banks and NBFCs, right? Because we've been getting the Q4 updates coming through. So on the gaining side, you have Bajaj Finance, HDFC, HDFC Bank, you have an Indusin Bank, which is losing, of course. So that's what's happening. Even a lot of the smaller names, the likes of Federal Bank of Maharashtra, these are all in focus as well. For tech stocks, it's pretty divided because some of the large cap IT names are holding up quite well. In fact, TCS is up almost 1.8%. So doing quite well over there, but the mid-cap tech companies are seeing some cuts today. So do keep that entire pack on your uh, radar. And for auto stocks as well, you have Aisha Maruti, which are seeing cuts. But Bajaj has moved to the high point of the day on the back of the management really telling us that, you know, they have seen the worst of it when it comes to expo uh, exports and there is a recovery now. So that's the market action. But let's get started by taking you through our top story. The call to buy India gets louder. Global brokerages say it is now time to accumulate. So Sonia standing by at the big wall with all of the details on this one. Sonia, looks like after valuations have corrected, a lot of brokerages feeling more comfortable now. Oh, absolutely. And as you said, you know, the chatter to buy Indian equities has gotten louder over the last few days. Indian equities have received three positive updates coming in from brokerages who are advising clients to accumulate as valuations have reached a reasonable level post the recent correction. Now, just to put it into perspective, the Nifty 50 index has corrected over 2,000 points from the all-time high that we saw on the 1st of December to a recent swing low of 16,828 on the 20th of March. Since then, brokerages, particularly foreign brokerage houses, have turned optimistic on the market, citing reasonable valuations. So let's start with Sunil Call, the India strategist of Goldman Sachs, who recommends buying India on dips, advising investors to buy quality as valuations are back to reasonable levels. The MSCI India index is now trading at 19 times forward price to earnings, compared to the Goldman Sachs fair value estimate of 18 and a half times. 
Goldman Sachs also said that they have retained their 12-month target on the Nifty 50 of 20,000 and remain overweight on sectors like banking and cement. Let's move on now to Bernstein, where Venugopal Gare of Bernstein is expecting Indian equity markets to see a quick rebound in the near term after six months of an underperformance to other emerging markets. He further said that the call for a rebound is premised on a confluence of tactical factors, including valuations and a bunch of macro factors as well. Among sectors, Bernstein likes a financials, real estate, state and cement that could be the biggest beneficiaries of this potential rebound. Now, if you remember a few days ago on the 31st of March, brokerage firm Morgan Stanley upgraded India to an equal weight from the earlier rating of underweight due to a narrowing valuation premium and a resilient economy. The brokerage said that it is bullish on India's structural growth outlook and that growth will be driven by a motley bunch of factors, digital infrastructure, empowered lending, um, dem the demographics which are improving domestic demand as well as improving foreign direct investment. Now, Morgan Stanley intends to focus on the financials and consumer discretionary sectors in India. They have in fact upgraded the consumer discretionary space to an overweight from an equal weight earlier and they've also turned constructive on healthcare, upgrading the sector to an equal weight from an underweight earlier. So, all in all, the chatter to buy India has now gotten only louder. All right, that's some good news coming in for the market. Thanks, Sonia, for giving us all those important details. All right, moving on from the macro brokerage calls to some of the stock-specific action that we are seeing today. And financials are showing big moves. So let's focus on that particular segment. Now, HDFC Bank, Bajaj Finance, as well as Poonawala FinCorp are all buzzing in trade on the back of their quarter four business updates. And Abhishek Kothari, our in-house banking and financial expert, gets us all those important details. Tell us, Abhishek. Uh, well, Nisha, loan growth has been pretty robust across lenders. So, to begin with, SDFC Bank, even that deposit momentum continued to, uh, continue to remain strong uh, despite Q3 also being strong. So, deposits grew by 20.8% YOI, the best in last 11 quarters. A growth of about 8.7% quarter quarter, perhaps the best in last 20 quarters. Loan growth was a bit tepid on a YOI basis, around 17%. However, sequential loan growth of 6.2% is perhaps the best in last four quarters. The credit to deposit ratio has declined on a sequential basis, but the low cost deposit and absolute value has increased by 9.6 percent quarter on quarter, which is heartening to see. So, the CASA ratio or the low cost deposit ratio that's improved on a sequential basis. X of pool or the loans that they sell down to uh, SDFC Limited, uh, the loan growth is about 17 uh, percent YOY and about 6.23 percent quarter on quarter. Coming on to Bajaj Finance, the AM growth is pretty healthy despite all the competition that is there around them. So, uh, the new loans is up 20.6% uh, YOY and a decline of 3% sequentially. Sequentially, you always see Q4 uh, new loans decline on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. So, nothing new over there. The customer base, that's up 20% YOY and about 4.5% sequentially. The cross-sell uh, rate, now that's disheartening to see that it's declined to 6.7% versus more than 7% in the previous quarter. This is a worrying factor. AM growth, however, at 29% YOY and about 7 0.15 percent quarter on quarter, one of the best growth on a sequential basis in last uh, four quarters. Punawala Fincop robust dispersals momentum has actually aided the AM growth this time around. So dispersals are up 89 percent quarter on quarter. AM growth is about 37 percent YOY and close to 16 percent uh, sequentially. However, AM to dispersal ratio is less than 19 percent, which is a disheartening factor. Asset quality has improved and liquidity in the balance sheet has declined on a sequential basis by 38% uh, back to you all right, Abhishek, thanks a lot for rounding up all of those numbers for us. That is the updates, the Q4 updates coming through for a lot of these financials. But the other two stocks that we're looking at are ONGC and Oil India. Both of these are gaining in trade, although, you know, they have come significantly off the highs. This after the government has cut windfall tax on crude petroleum to nil. So brokerage has CLSA has also issued a bullish note on both of these stocks. Sonal is here to tell us more about that. Sonal? Well, it's a short-term positive, of course, for oil producers, the likes of ONGC and Oil India. The news is that the government has gone ahead and they've cut the windfall taxes on crude production to zero versus 3,500 rupees per tonne earlier. Remember, it is the first time in nine months that this has happened. The first time it was levied was back in July. As far as export duty or special additional excise duty on diesel is concerned, it has been cut to 0.5, uh, 2.5 rupees per litre versus 1 rupees earlier. On petrol and ATF, it continues to be nil. 
Uh, now, uh, CLSA says that yes, it is a positive uh, for Reliance Industries. This is the lowest impact that they are seeing of windfall taxes on their diesel exports. So that bodes well for the company. Uh, right now, these companies are making post uh, tax realizations of around seventy-five dollars a barrel, and that's why they have a buy on oil and ONGC. But do remember, in last couple of uh, trading days, we have seen oil spurt to levels of eighty-five dollars a barrel uh, because of the OPEC cuts that we've been talking about. That means that yes, in the next revision, there is a possibility that these wind fall taxes could come back so while it's a short term relief for for these companies in the longer term we could see a hike in windfall taxes so far they've been able to make uh, post tax realizations of 70 to 75 dollars per barrel uh, that could continue and that is something that the street is uh, analyzing and watching out for closely all right uh, thanks so much sonal for getting us all the details biggest takeaway it's a short term relief we'll have to see for the next review of those taxes as well now stocks of gas distribution companies igl and mgl trade higher today uh, cnbc tv18 also learns from sources that the cabinet may take up the gas pricing issue in the upcoming meet remember that earlier this week the government kept the apm gas price unchanged at 8.57 dollars per mm btu and the new gas pricing regime will kick in if kirit parekh recommendations are accepted so important point to watch out for all right that is important on the gas pricing picture but with that let's talk about the big queue that we are all focusing on that is the reserve bank's two day monetary policy meeting which is currently underway and the rate decision is due tomorrow morning 90% of the participants of the cnbc tv18 mpc poll see rates being hiked by 25 basis points this time around so my colleague ritu is here with all of the highlights from that survey Well it looks like we're nearing the end of the rate hike cycle but before RBI well and truly changes course there could be one more hike in the April policy 90% of our respondents expect that the MPC will hike repo rates by 25 basis points in this policy taking it to a 7 year high of 6.75% the culprit here is inflation which remains stubbornly above RBI's comfort level and of course the other area of consideration for the MPC is going to be action by other global central banks but RBI has maintained that it is guided by domestic factors All of the respondents to our poll said that the April hike will probably be the last one in the current monetary tightening cycle which began in May last year. The peak rates are seen at 6.75% by the majority, but after this rate hike, RBI is expected to pause for a while before it starts to reverse these hikes. So 40% of our respondents believe that we could only see cuts in the second half of this financial year whereas a third expect the first rate cut to only be delivered in the first quarter of the next financial year 30% expected to happen perhaps sooner now rbi could also raise the cpi forecast for fy23 marginally given the unexpected high inflation readings recently while leaving the 5.3% cpi forecast for fy24 unchanged the rbi is also unlikely to tinker with the growth forecast while some expect a marginal lowering almost 30% of our respondents said they expect the stance of the policy to also be changed to neutral but a much larger majority of 70% believe it will be left unchanged at withdrawal of accommodation because rbi may not yet be comfortable enough to signal that they are done with the rate hikes given the global uncertain outlook All right Ritu Singh thanks so much for getting us all those details on what's expected in the big event tomorrow in the RBI monetary policy so rate reversal not yet is the consensus coming out let's take a break on that note but up next on business lunch we'll tell you about the global genetic testing market and how india is slowly becoming a competitive player in this space stay tuned we really you know sort of hit it and took away the indexation all right uh, right pavitra so the debt fund uh, really saw pick up after uh, the amendments that were really made uh, in the finance bill and before the 31st of march a lot of the inflows really come in we'll talk more about that with pavitra but uh, let's uh, first also look at something that we had promised uh, in the last very segment and we are talking about the genetic uh, market um, testing market that we are really talking about and ekta is right here to talk about it and how slowly india is making a mark in this particular competitive space ekta over to you 
Thanks for that. Well, yes, uh, you know, the India reports indicate that the global genetic testing market is currently worth around uh, $17 billion in terms of market size. And with the Indian size relatively small at around $60 million. However, while the size might be small, India is known to offer actually some of the cheapest genetic tests in the world, priced at 50 to 70% in terms of a discount to its global peers. And the market is only becoming more competitive. For example, a few weeks ago, the buzz was reliance owned Bangalore based genomics based research and diagnostics company Strand Diagnostics was rolling out one of their most economical offerings a genome sequencing test at 12,000 rupees genome testing is also known as genetic testing is the process of analyzing any individual's DNA to identify any genetic variations or mutations that may cause or increase the risk of developing a particular disease or condition this can be done for both healthy individuals who want to understand their genetic disposition to certain diseases as well as for those who have been diagnosed with a disease to determine its underlying cause now genome testing is different from routine lab tests as they require more investments in technology and skilled personnel while it is growing genome testing is still up to 10 percent of the sales for most of the traditional diagnostic players companies such as strand diagnostics that was bought by reliance industries in 2021 map my genome and med genome focus more specifically on genome testing there are two broad categories of genome testing a retail focused test that is more directional directional and may require not require clinicians directive and specialized clinicians oriented tests that are more high-end and medically actionable the commonality in both is B2B and B2C genome testing is pricing yes while some specialized tests can go up to around 70 to 80,000 rupees the average genome test package ranges anywhere between 7,000 to 12,000 rupees for example map my genomes genome part 3 which convert, covers more than 100 health conditions is offered at 699 while med genomes comprehensive inherited disorders cancer test is offered at around 12,000 lastly while genome testing has been around for over a decade in India, experts say there is a need for stronger regulation and overview in the B2C market as seen in the US where drug regulators in fact halted DNA testing by Google backed firm 23andMe's for two years due to lack of data to back up its marketing claims. Experts say India needs a clearer definition on what genome testing is and especially what type of genetic test can be marketed to patients directly. All right, Ekta, thanks a lot for getting us that complete picture on genetic testing in India. But with that, let's move on and talk about this uh, important data that came through. This has actually been compiled by Value Research. And, you know, we have been talking about the entire debt fund space, right, after the recent amendments to the tax rules sort of really took away that indexation benefit and hit this entire space. Now, what happened is that you basically had one week to put in money into the debt space if you wanted to sort of grab that indexation benefit. Of course, we saw, you know, all of the flows really surge. Now, if you take a look at some of the categories, we have them up on your screen. So target maturity funds in the first week of March saw around 500 crores in terms of an inflow. By the last week of March, you saw 15,000 crores. That is the kind of jump we saw. Corporate bonds were around 60 crores. This went up to over 10,400 crores. Dynamic bonds, similarly, you know, for all of them, I'm not going to read out all of the names, but they're up on your screen. That is the kind of big jump that we've seen. Now, if you take a look at the fund houses, which actually managed to clock in the biggest uh, gains, we have Aditya Birla Sun Life. This is their corporate bond, which saw over 3,000 crores in terms of a flow just from this. ICICI Pro saw over 1,900 uh, you know, over 1,900 crores in terms of the last week flows. This is versus the 53 in the first week. So this is the kind of big jump that we saw. Now, you know, if you take a look at the top 12 of these funds, the maximum beneficiaries were in corporate bond funds as well as target maturity funds. We all know target maturity funds have anyway been a very popular category. So this saw, uh, you know, some more flows come into that space. Uh, target maturity funds saw around 2,800 crores in terms of a flow. This is for the last week, whereas corporate bonds saw over 7,700 crores. That is the kind of uh, money that moved into these spaces. Now I'm quickly going to run you through some data which is from Amphi and this is on the AUM growth that you've seen in some of the debt categories. Long duration funds saw AUM jump 21%. This is for the last week. Guilt funds up around 19%, so on and so forth. But, you know, this is the kind of move that we've seen just because people were, you know, Nisha trying to take advantage of this indexation benefit in the last few days and before that April 1st deadline. 
I think uh, taking uh, tax benefits before the year end is yeah. one of the prime jobs and tax experts <laughs> yeah. make a lot of money out of that uh, as well. So yes, a uh, good amount of fund flow in the debt funds ahead of the 1st April deadline where the taxation really kicks in as per the amendments made in the finance bill. Now let's uh, focus on something which is going to be a uh, serious in terms of uh, the understanding of the health condition. Well, COVID cases are on a rise once again. And India reported 4,435 new COVID-19 cases and the biggest single day jump in over 160 days. So the number of active cases increased to 21,179 and 15 deaths in the last 24 hours as per the official data from the health ministry. Now on Tuesday, Maharashtra reported 711 new COVID-19 cases, nearly a 200% jump from the Monday's 248 cases. So the Mumbai city of Mumbai alone really reported over 200 cases on Tuesday, while the national capital reported over 500 cases at the same time. So taking note of the rising number of COVID-19 cases in India, well, the Chief Justice of India, D.Y. Chandrachur, said that the lawyers could consider appearing virtually for the hearing. So looks like, uh, you know, COVID is back to haunt us. We have to be careful at this point, uh, Pavitra, mm -hmm. and uh, looking at the surge that we are seeing in the COVID cases again. Oh, absolutely. We should, you know, I mean, take all necessary precautions at a time like this. But um, and of course, we'll keep bringing you updates on the numbers as well. But with that, we do need to get into a short break in the show. When we come back, there's lots more news and updates. So you stay tuned for that. Welcome back. You're watching Business Lunch and Markets and Status Quo with Good Gains today. Let's also get you an important update from the courts today and the Chief Justice of India-led Supreme Court bench has cautioned the center for invoking the national security out of thin air to hurt press freedom. This is an important case. The apex court further observed that mere invocation of national security will not exempt judicial scrutiny and independent press is crucial for a democratic setup. And remember, the Supreme Court was pronouncing judgment on plea by Kerala-based Media One Channel against non-renewal of the license as the Home Affairs Ministry withdrew the security clearance, citing national security and public order. All right, that is something important that we got in terms of the press freedom issue and what the Supreme Court has to say on it. But another another important update is that India has outrightly rejected the renaming of places in Arunachal Pradesh by China. Remember, Beijing has claimed sovereignty over the region and they've also attempted to rename places in the border state. Responding to the reports, Ministry of External Affairs official spokesperson said that this is not the first time that China has made such an attempt and India rejects it outrightly. The state further adds that uh, Arunachal will always be an integral part of India. All right, and some more news from the world of uh, sports then. And the Indian Premier League got underway over the weekend and viewership data indicates that the opening weekend alone had more reach than the entire of last year's tournament with 147 crore views recorded on Geo Cinema. Now, the viewing time was 67% higher than in 2022, with an average of 57 minutes per viewer. The Geo Cinema app has also seen over 5 crore downloads, 2.5 crores of which were on the 31st of March, setting the record for the most installed app in a single day. So quite a sporting weekend we had and very exciting uh, also like that, Pavitra. Do you follow IPL? I don't too much, but I know you do. Yes. So, and, uh, and I'm going to get all the updates from you. So Mumbai Indians uh, is what I was cheering yeah. for, but uh, unfortunately other teams played better. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but anyway, this is, uh, you know, and those numbers are crazy, right? Huge jump in the numbers as well that we got in terms of what Geo has clocked in. So that is what we are tracking today. And with that, we're going to wind down on this edition of Business Lunch with the news that the markets are in fine fettle. Thanks for tuning in. Midcap Radar, up next.